Evening ladies and gents, my name is Simon Brown from Just One Lap. So as always I put this up here and I always make the same comment. I like rules in my trading life. I like lots of rules, I like rigid rules and I stick to those rigid rules. Of course as human beings typically we don't like rules, we don't stick to rules and we're not very good at rules. So what we typically need is actually a bit of a blend in between. Probably a skewing towards the, the having lots of rules but leaving some space for for want of a better phrase, to, for you to make your own decisions. I, I dislike that intensely because I think the biggest single risk in your trading life is you or me or the individual and in that we do stupid things, mostly around fear and greed. So I'm very much a rules-based trader and this evening's presentation does skew back to that, let's put the rules in place and let's tra trade those rules. Point being, and the critical point as always, is it's not to say you can't take those rules and tweak and change and do whatever you want with them. In other words, make them your rules. This is a system I designed in 2004, but I've tweaked it over many, many years uh, until eventually it gets to where it currently is. So I call it the lazy trading system because I'm lazy and it's a trading system and it needed a name and that seemed like a really, really good name. It's actually based on a system by uh, Daryl Guppy, an Australian chap, you can go. So he's got a system predominantly for FX and indice to a degree that uses nine moving averages. Um, I was using that back in the day or trying it. It was just to the comment here, nine was like a lot of moving averages, like, like approximately six too many. Um, <clears throat> so then I, I redesigned it in 2004 um, with the intent of, of, of using it for day trading and did day trade it for a while in 06, uh, 05, 06. Um, and as I said, have evolved it over, over many years to the point where in its current uh, current form, it's been this way probably since 2008 or there's around. So it's been like this for a fair bit. In fact, 2007, because I traded it through the crisis as well. Um, it's around catching trends. So the point of the system is really, really simple to catch a trend. This is not looking to catch breakouts. This is not looking for reversal patterns or calling tops or calling bottoms. This is about catching a trend, which means in the last two years and 10 months in our local market on the top 40 on a daily or a weekly chart, it's been quite tough because the broad trend, although within a wide range of about 15%, that trend has been to go sideways. Uh, but as soon as a proper trend, you know, the, the indie when it had that humongous run up from 20 odd thousand to 70 odd thousand, it caught that trend and it rode it the entire way. I went along the indie at around 23,000 and I bailed at around 72,000. It took a couple of years. I mean, this didn't happen overnight. It was an ungeared position. But when the trend happens, it works as advertised and as it should. It works in indices and currencies. It does not work on equity. Now, it could be adapted to work on equity, and we can talk about that later uh, when I come to a process around how we can adapt it. It could be adapted to work on equity, but I have tested it, and I know people who have tried it, and the point with equity, quite simply, is the increased volatility. Indices and currencies are lower volatile, vo volatile, therefore this is what it's designed for. It's designed to find a trend, hop on the bus, and ride a trend which doesn't go in a straight line. Nothing goes in a straight line. But, you know, your volatility on indices and, and currencies is significantly lower than on equities. So it doesn't work on, on equity at all. If you're trading on a, on, a, on a weekly chart, it's literally 10 minutes of effort and it can work on a weekly chart. Um, and if you're trading on a weekly chart, you will get trades. Uh, in that indie trade that I ran in, it was from 20, 2011 to 2014, so it was a three-year trade. Um, it will give you exceedingly long trades. It will... Uh, work on different time frames. It can go down to a five minute time frame. I have in the past traded it in five minute time frames. I don't like five minute. I, I, I can't see any upside to five minute charts. Um, I've got some examples here this evening of using it on a one hour time frame, but it will work across the different time frames. The question you need to ask yourself is, what do you want from your trading? And what I mean by that is, do you, do you want to spend eight, 10 hours a day sitting in front of a screen trading a five or 15 or 30 minute chart? Or do you want to spend 10 minutes a day or 10 minutes a week trading a daily or a weekly chart? And that, that's the question you need to ask yourself. One issue I will raise that if you have a job and you think you can have a job and you can trade intraday, you're going to lose money with both. 
because your boss will fire you unless you are the boss uh, and uh, you will lose money on the trading side. Um, I've seen far too many people, I mean, I, to be truthful, I've tried it. Um, although I, at least I worked for a stockbroker, so they thought I was working. Um, it can spend a lot of time at cash. So I'm trading it at the moment on uh, indices, local and offshore, and I'm trading it on weekly charts and I'm trading it ungeared. And we are currently 87.5% in cash, and this year we have mostly been 87.5% in cash. Uh, when markets go sideways, when markets go down, certainly when they go sideways, it will go cash. And the way I'm trading it, in the ungeared space, I'm doing longs only. So when the market starts to turn down, I go to cash as well. So in 2008, when the market collapsed from top to bottom 50%, it's a kid playing airplanes, people. Let the kid be. <laughs> He's having fun. <laughs> We would all love to be playing aeroplanes just close to holidays. Um, in 2008, when the market collapsed, it took me to cash. And during the whole crisis, I'm in cash. And what happens is, you're sitting in cash, earning nice interest rates. At one point, interest rates were double digits in this market. So you're earning nice interest rates while markets fall away. So in collapsing markets, you do very well because in, in the sense that you outperform massively. And then when the market bottoms and starts to turn again, you get back on the bus and off you go. If you're trading long and short, of course, you will trade the downsides as well as the upsides in the equation. There is an argument to be made that says you only trade long. In other words, you don't take short trades. And there's a simple reason for it. And, and the, the same argument applies in the equity space as it does in the index space. Is that short trading is high risk, high volatile. You know, sure, an index can lose, and you know, when, when, when things are falling apart, an index can go down. I mean, let's look at Trump at Brexit. In both examples, index down 5% pre-market open. How often do we see an index up 5% pre-market open? Never. You know, just never. So your volatility on the downside is significantly increased. But because there's volatility, it collapses, it rallies, you get stopped, it collapses, you're not in the trade anymore. So there's a lot to be said for, for making a decision that says, you know what, the idea of trading short and making money on the short side is great. And how cool to be around the braai on a Saturday afternoon with your buddies and they're all losing money in their equity accounts and you're making money because you're short. I mean, I get all of that. But there's a lot to be said for actually, thanks, but no. In all of my trading systems, I only do shorts in one of them. I trade top 40 Aussie and that I do shorts. All the others only take long positions. And that's fine. Markets spend more time going up than they do going down or going sideways. It doesn't feel like it after almost three years of sideways, but that is how it, how it really, really works. So w when markets go sideways, as we've seen recently, what happens is you're going to get a lot of short duration losing trades. You won't lose a lot. You'll lose percent, half a percent, whatever the case may be. But a lot of get in, run a bit, stop out. A while later, get back in, run a bit, stop out. There's some tweaks that I made to the system back in 2009 that reduced that to a degree. But if you are a trend-based system, you expect a sideways market to lose your money. That's just that's just trading. You know, it, it, so the 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 cheat then is to try and have a pre-filter that tells you whether this market is trending or not, um, and if it's going sideways, a pre-filter that says stay out. And there's nothing I can find that does that. You can use things like ADX and all of that. But what happens is you end up, you avoid some losing trades, but then you miss some winning trades. And at the end of the day, all comes out evens. Uh, and plenty of ways, I'll come to the end of round ways to look at it. So, so in a nutshell, I'm going to go through the process of how we use the system three times from three different directions. The first rule of this system is trade in the direction of the primary trend. In other words, if the primary trend is a market is going higher, you only take long positions. If the primary trend of market is going down, you only take short positions. So that first filter says you're only taking longs or shorts. So for example, the Resi 10 locally, the primary trend has been down now for about two and a bit years. So this rally that we've seen this year, haven't traded it because the primary trend remains down on a weekly chart. Now that's fine. I mean, there has been a rally. There was some money to be made. Um, in truth, it had stretched for, for reasons I'll go into later. There wasn't much. But I'm always only going to trade in the, in, in the primary direction that the market is moving. I define that primary direction using exponential moving averages. And I use the 30 and the 60 exponential moving average. So if the 30 EMA is above the 60, 
I say trend is up and I only take longs. If the 30 is below the 60, I say trend is down and I only take short trades. So the first screen I look at is where's my big direction in terms of, of the 30 and the 60. And then I only take the trades in that direction. So that immediately says, and the trick around that is quite simple. So in a sideways market like this, it means you, there's opportunity to have gone short, which hasn't triggered. So you, you know, I, I, I technically got a short trade on the Indy oh, about 20% ago on the index, but didn't take it because the primary trend had been up. The point is, is that when a, when a market is properly trending and a market is properly moving higher, you don't want to be caught in those small little pullbacks. You want to use those small little pullbacks to reload, add to the trade and go off again. So that's why we have that filter which says initially get that direction and only trade in that direction in which the market is going. The second step is wait for price to revert to primary trend. And what I use here is my 15 exponential moving average. And what I mean by that, so my 30 is above 60, trend is up. Price is currently below the 15 EMA. So big trend is up, small trend is down. When the price goes up and closes through, that's my trigger. I'll show this for pictures. Some of you are looking confused at me for the folks who like pictures, like me, I've got pictures coming too. So when price cups up, that's my trigger. I use a two-step entry process. The two-step entry process says I enter on the next candle. And I'll show you examples of why I do that. The two-step entry process really saves your bacon in a market like we have seen this year. So what it means is you get a trigger, but it never confirms. And in a market that's going sideways, of the triggers that we have had in the last uh, three years almost, probably, and I, I'm grabbing at numbers here, but say the, the, the 15 triggers we've had to buy, 11 of them have failed, which means you've only had four trades. They were all losing trades, but you've had four losing trades instead of 15 losing trades. So that's how I try and manage that sideways part of the market. I said that you could use an ADX or something like that. Instead, I do a two-step confirmation process. And that keeps me out. It doesn't keep me out perfectly. It's not 100% perfect. But it keeps me out when things don't look so, when, when, when things are going sideways. So here it is looking in pictures. 30 and 60, exponential moving averages. 30 above 60, so you're looking for long trades only. There's your 15. Price comes along from below the 15, cuts up, and there's your trigger. Just as simple as that. 30 and 60. Price cuts up through 15. If price was already above 15, you do nothing. If price is below these two, doesn't matter. These two you don't care about. It's the 30 and the 60 relative to each other and the 15 and the price relative to each other. You don't care where price is relative to the 30 and the 60. You don't care where the 15 is relative to the 30 and the 60. You look at them separately. You take the 30 and the 60, primary direction. You take the price and the 15, trigger and then price for confirmation. So let's look at pictures. So same, there's my 30 is the blue, my red is the 60, green is my 15. Price goes up, breaks up through the candle. This is, it happens to be a weekly, it happens to be the indie chart, but that's neither here nor there. The waiting, but hasn't yet confirmed. Let's go back to the left-hand side of the chart. We can see that giant green candle cuts up through the 15. That is a trigger. But we can see that we don't get a positive close after that. We get a red candle, we get a red candle, trigger has failed, you walk away from the process. Again, in the middle here, we get a green candle breaking up through the 15. Nice. But, red followed by red, followed by red, failed. In other words, in this case here, and I can tell you what happened on the third candle, it triggered and it failed. So, and this is weekly, so this is over a three or so month period on the Indy. We kept on getting buys, they failed to confirm. We kept on getting a buy, failed to confirm. Buy, failed to confirm. So it means instead of, a brief in a second, instead of entering three trades and getting stopped, we entered zero trades. Is it always, it has to be green on the next candle? Good question. The answer is no. And I'll show you some example of that there. So for example here, let's go back to the far left where we've got the green candle. Next one's red, but we're still above the 15. The trigger is still live. If we then get a green candle, now we're in biz. As long as you're above the 15, the trigger is live. I've got pictures of that here. So here's one that worked perfectly. We can see the pullback down to it. We can see that first green candle, which just closed above 15, and then the next green candle confirmed. 
This is the, the, the perfect setup in a sense, because what have you actually got? And you can't see the rest of the chart, but this is a fairly strong trend coming up. In this case, it's a small pullback, which gives you a buy signal, and then off it roared again and got you back into the trade. Um, so here's an example to Christia's question. So the first candle's green, but second candle doesn't confirm, but it remains above the 15 EMA, so the trigger remains live third candle confirms and you enter on that third candle which in this case is the second green candle as long as we stay above the 15 that trigger is still live so do you enter once the price is closed is i okay? enter on close critical point i enter on close because i need that candle to you know if it's five minutes to the close and it's green and you say hey what could happen <laughs> i've got two words for you <laughs> trump brexit <laughs> you know a lot can happen so I wait for the close now what I'm doing here I'm actually trading this on a weekly chart and I cheat because the last thing I want to be doing at five o'clock on a Friday is you know fiddling around on my online stockbroker buying and selling stuff man I'd rather be off drinking so what I do is I enter at 9 30 on Monday morning because on a weekly chart half an hour you know it's neither here nor there so I'm actually entering on the Monday. why 9 30 because I need the market makers to be into the market so I'm actually, and also because I'm now also trading the US, uh, FTSE, uh, Europe and Japan. And of course, you know, I can tell you there are many things I'm doing at 10 o'clock on a Friday evening, sitting in front of my computer buying S&P 500 is not one of them. Here's another example. So first green candle, trigger, second red, cancelled the trigger because it went back, back below the 15. Then we get another green candle, and then that confirmation going forward. This making sense? I'm going to go through it lots. I'm going to come back to it lots. I'm going to send you, I'll have some links coming up in a moment where we can talk about it. No, so, so good question. So this red candle, which sits here on the far left, is a close below, but my 30 is above 60. So I'm only looking for a buy. So I ignored that because, so that is technically, if you're only trading on the 15 EMA, that would be yourself, the first red candle. But because my 30 is above my 60, I'm only looking to buy, and therefore I ignore the sell signal. I'm not interested in it at all. What I am interested in is then the green candle comes along and jumps up, but fails the following week. And then the following, following week. So this process is one, two, three, four, five weeks before I enter a trade. These happen to be weekly charts. But in truth, you'll note, okay, I haven't. But in most cases, I've actually stripped the price, the time off the bottom because the time is irrelevant. That, those candles could be anything from one minute to monthly. That's how, you know, it depends how you want to trade in essence. I, I have no desire to spend eight hours a day in front of a screen, so I go to a weekly chart from it. In my all-Z trading, I'm running a daily chart. Quick word on, on, on now I'll come back to all-Z in a moment. Oh, where did it go from there on? Where did it go from there? Um, so this is the mid cap. This is June. Yeah, those two candles could have been a failure. Yeah, no. So I can tell you it happened to carry on higher. This happens. To, so this is the mid cap. The mid cap ultimately went into the seventy thousands, and this is fifty six thousand. So it did go higher. So it, and it kept in the trade. I had a very nice trade in the mid cap. I think it was. Well, I can see June. So second half of last year which was the gold stocks. Remember when gold stocks all went crazy and they were all in the mid cap. Um, so I, I caught that indirectly, not by trading the gold stocks, but by getting a buy signal on the mid cap. Ha. <laughs> um, so you will note there is a relationship, 15, 30, 60. Could you use, so I think, and I have no evidence for this, I think that the one, two, four relationship is important. In other words, 15, double to 30, double to 60, one, two, four. Um, the, the thing is, and I, I, back in 2004, and understand that you know, my, my, my computing skills are not brilliant. I ran different, different, different uh, ideas through the system. What I was looking for was that relationship of one, two, four. Or should it be one, 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 two, three, or something? I was looking for that relationship. And definitely the one, two, four came out best. From that point, it's like which ones to use. And it, it, I dug around and it came out 15, 30, 60. But one of the things you can absolutely change is change the 15, 30, 60. 
My advice, and maybe it's bunk advice, would be to keep that relationship one, two, four, but to maybe make it 10, 20, 40, or make it 30, 60, 120. So what are those changes going to be? If you shorten it to 10, 20, 40, or 5, 10, 20, what will happen is you will pick up more trades for smaller trades. In other words, you'll catch smaller moves. You'll catch smaller moves, you'll catch more of them. If you push it out to say 30, 60, 120, you will catch less trades, but in theory the ones that work will pay significantly more profit. The key caveat, another key caveat is that if you push those numbers out to 30, 60, 120, you will not, you know, the market will rally 15% before you get in. Whereas if you push it to 5, 10, 20, the market rallies 3% and you get in. Of course, there's a very risk that when it rallies 3% and you get in, it's a fake rally and you get kicked out. Is 15, 30, 60 the perfect? I mean, I hope so. I, I, would, I would love to think that I stumbled upon the perfect. You know, I, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm a very simple person. I, I played some numbers, I ran some stuff in Excel, and I found something that seemed to be relatively robust, and I thought brilliant. And to me, the key indicator of a robustness of a trading system is two things. Does it work across different time frames? And does it work across different assets? And if you get the answer to yes to those two, you've got a really, really robust trading system. The key thing of the turtle trading system is that it works across any time frame, any asset class. This works across the time frames. The assets, not so much. So it works brilliant on indices, it works brilliant on FX, it works terrible on equity, and it works okay on commodities. I've never really pushed the commodity angle, because weirdly enough, although we are a commodity economy. Well, we're not, but we, like, we, we were once and we still sometimes think we are. Although we were once a commodity economy, back in the day as a South African to trade commodities was impossible. I mean literally just 10, 12 years ago to trade commodities in South Africa you had to go to the, the Rand refinery and buy an, a Kruger Rand. That was it. You know, subsequent to that, we've got p providers such as uh, IG, we've got the commodity futures on the JSC. It has become easier. But just a decade ago, commodities were almost impossible to trade. So a lot of the older folks, and I, I throw myself in that band, have just never traded commodities and almost consider it to be a, you know, thing. I had a kid today, he wants to trade iron ore. It's like, dude, how do you trade? I, I have no idea. I mean, I do know how you trade iron ore, right? Pretty much... The earth is made of iron ore. Go to your back garden, scratch around, haul up some iron ore and try and sell it to somebody. He didn't like that answer either. But I don't know how to trade it. That, that, that was my honest answer. No, so that's a great question. The 15, 30, 60 I use across everything. And, I, and by that I mean I use it on currencies and indices. I use it, so locally I trade the sub-indices. Mid-cap, Indy, Resi, Finney. Uh, S&P 500, FTSE 100, Dow Jones 0, Stocks 50 and Nikkei 225. And I, I've used it across all. I have... In times, and not recent times, a couple of years, four or so years ago, I looked at tweaking, you know, for different and the like, um, and that didn't seem to, to in much way yield any better returns, and mostly it gave me headaches. So if you mean by do I sometimes get the entry point wrong, as in do I sometimes lose money? Absolutely. Oh, yeah. So, in the, so, so I mean, the, 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 the one thing about this system is I now have, at the end of this month, I have 12 years of data on it. Um, the problem is I've tweaked it, so I only really have about six or so years of current exactly the same way. But it, it has a win ratio of, the, of the, the six or so years, which is the most reliable period because there's been no changes in that period. It has a win ratio of around 42%. In other words, 42% of my trades make me money. So therefore, 58% lose money. The trick is, is that those 58% that lose me money, on average, lose 1.6%. And the 42 that make me money make on average 13%. And the 13% is deeply skewed when you buy the Indy 25 at 24,000 and sell it at 72,000 and make 300% on a single trade. Um, and if I pull that out of the equation, which is perhaps a fair thing to do, I mean, we could call that an outlier. The point with trading is that when you trade long enough, you will get outliers. The key point with trading is make sure that the outliers that are in your favor you maximize, 
and the outliers that are against you, you pull as quick as possible, i.e. stop loss. But if we pull that ND out, my average winners are about uh, 3.6, which means I've got a slightly better, sorry, 3.8, I've got a slightly, about a two and a half uh, ratio, two and a half to one winner versus loser in terms of profit, and a 42.58 in terms of winners and losers. The two-step system made a humongous difference. You will note in some of the others, and I particularly mentioned it in the, in the I mean, you'll see, you'll see grains of this trading system across everything I trade. You'll see in the CFD one I did, remember the two-step, get the confirmation, but then draw a line and wait for that to be breached. You know, the MACD confirms in the weekly, enter into the daily chart and do the confirmation there. You'll see in the 721, again, no, that, uh, no, that wasn't. That was the case of if the candle runs. But you'll see a lot of the two key things which sit in this system. One is try and determine big picture, trade with the big picture. I was listening to a podcast on the way here called Odd Lots. It comes out of Bloomberg, uh, the stalwart, if you follow him on Twitter, and then some lady whose name escapes me. Um, and they were talking about, and what they were particularly talking about, uh, lots of things, but the one conversation they had in the, in the podcast was how... There are, there are memes that run in the market. And at the moment, the meme that is running in the market is, yay, we're going to have inflation. And inflation is good for economies because it gives pricing power and everything else. And ergo, the US, the US stock markets have gone crazy because Trump will create inflation. But if you look at the data, inflation started appearing in May. But the meme started with Trump. In other words, there might be stuff that is happening that is true, but what matters in the market is what's the meme? What's the consensus view? What are people saying is happening? Whether it's true or not is not important. It's a case of where's the herd? Well, there it is. Cool. That's where the money is. The herd might be wrong. For the people who've been saying we have no inflation in the US and that's the end of the world, they've been wrong since May. We have had, so since May, we've seen wage inflation, we've seen factory gate inflation, we've seen all, and I'm talking US economy here, we have seen real inflation coming through in the US market since May, but no one's talked about it before Trump got elected. So if you were the sort of folk who were saying, oh, inflation here is everyone's wrong, don't be the oak who sticks your hand up and says, hey, you, you all wrong, because they don't care. They're going to mow you down. You know, have your view, have your opinion, but then find the bus, whatever it might be, and jump on it. Now, I'm making money thanks to the orange bigot. Do I mind? So, I mean, I haven't. I mean, broadly, so, so they, go, they go one, two, four, whereas Fibonacci would go one, two, uh, three, five, eight, and, and, and so on. So it's not perfectly Fibonacci, no. I mean, there's, a, there's a pattern to it, but the Fibonacci pattern is, is the, the cone effect that happens, whereas my pattern is just stepping blocks. So the, the Fibonacci is much prettier. Yes. Yes. So I did, I did back in the day, back in 2004, I did try it with the Fibonacci's. So I did 1, 2, 3, um, which would have made 15, 30, and 45 in an essence. Um, and I, I don't remember, but I, I, picked, I picked 1, 2, 4. So I'm assuming that the 1, 2, 3 didn't work as well. Yeah. If you want the genesis of this, remember, go to Daryl Guppy. Um, and I emailed him once and he said, I'm welcome to use it as long as I mention his name. Would using Bollinger Bands increase the likelihood of staying in the trade for longer? Yeah. Look, I've got a bias. I don't like Bollinger Bands. Um, so I'm going to say no, but I'm going to say it's worth digging into. Absolutely worth digging. One of the key things with trading systems, and it's all trading systems, is I stand up here, or someone stands up here, and we present a trading system, and that's very, very nice. What's critically important is you've got to make it your own. So you mentioned Fibonacci, you mentioned Bollinger Bands, etc., etc. To go home and to say, well, let's take the, the core of Simons, but let's throw some Bollinger Bands on. Let's, throw, let's try the one, two, three instead. And the reason is quite simple. Because at, when times get tough, you have to trust a trading system. And it's hard enough to trust a trading system when you designed it. It's a heck lot harder when some oak in a fancy suit to you haven't seen before or since designed it. You know, you're thinking, well, he's living on an island somewhere, and yeah, I'm doing the hard graft. So you need to personalize it. Now, it, you know, and in some cases, you take this, it works, it slipped, that's fine. If, and if, it, if you're happy, that's perfectly. But I'm, don't be scared to personalize it. Don't be scared to try things. You know, trading ultimately is a trial and error game.
you try different things, you see what works, you're off to the races. Uh, so there was part of the indie trade. So th the reason I want to come to this, so this indie trade entered, there was my first entry in October of 2011. Uh, it's actually around 27,000. And ultimately it ran, it ran to 20, uh, 72, 75,000, whatever it is. The point is it will sometimes give you new entries. So in other words, we got an entry here first error we got a second entry uh we got a third entry up there which was like over a year later the third error i'm i will re-enter in other words i've already got a long position at the first error i get a second buy signal will i enter the position yes one proviso <coughs> my new stop loss is above my first entry point in other words my first portion of the trade is in profit then I will re-enter. So the indie trade, ultimately, and as it got towards the end, and obviously as a, as a trend gets towards the end and weakens and starts to turn, it will start falling back and giving you more and more buys, which is why I will enter, I will add to a position if my stop loss is above my average entry price. So here it was perfect. There's my entry price, uh, second trade, Stop loss above entry. I haven't told you stop yet. I'll come to that in a second. And by the time we get to here, to 2013 April, I mean, my stop loss is, my entry price is 30 odd thousand points away. So there's absolutely no problem at all. I trail the stop. I trail the stop. Our stop comes now. I lied to you. It wasn't next slide. It's two slides. <laughs> the, the key thing with this is, <coughs> is this happens to be a weekly chart. You... I'm not sure that you can take a three-year geared trade and not just get killed by interest and everything. You know, this is a great example, and, but this was an ungeared trade. But again, ignore the, the, the fact that this is weekly. This could be hourly candles, in which case this trade is two and a half weeks. But if you're looking to trade it on weekly, I would be cautious about using gearing. And I'm being polite there because I'm in the mecca of gearing. Because when I look ever so closely, it never closed below. So I needed to close back below the green, and the red candle there didn't. Therefore, not a buy. Which is deeply unfortunate, because we are in a great place to have another buy. But, hey, happens. So how do we get out? Stop loss only. The thing with trading a trend is quite simple. When you hop on the bus, where is it going? People who bought iron ore at $50 didn't expect it to go to $180 a ton, but it did. Uh, and it, it, it happens, I mean, the, the thing with trends is that they, are in, they, they drive you crazy for two reasons. One, because they pretend to start a dozen times and they never do. And then when they do start, they can go on and on and on. I mean, this indie here, and remember, this indie went to 72000 So in truth, we are halfway through the trade. You buy the Indy at 26,000 and say, yeah, I'm going to 72. And the, the, you are crazy. But that's what it did. If you used, so then the question is, well, how do you exit? Well, you say once I've made twice or this, or once I've made 10% or something like that. Remember the trading. There are five types of trades that you will have in terms of profit. You have the break-even trade. Small profit, small loss trade. Big profit, big loss trade. Now, we remove the big loss trade with stop loss. But now we need the big profit trade. That big profit trade is critically important to us making, you know, it's the difference between making you know, all right money and beating the bank rate by half a percent and beating the market by a factor of, of, of 10. We need those big trades. So how do you stay in with a big trade? You get out on a stop. You don't take a target. Because I tell you now, if I'd showed you this chart up to end of 2012 and I'd said, right, you're long two positions here, at what level are you taking profit? Maybe some of you would have said 30,000. And this thing went to 72. It gave you another buy, but the next buy was at 42. And that's because, you know, you're buying something at 24, 26. Our brain can't see beyond 30. Your brain can't see 300%. It's insane. And if you went into every trade and said, I'm going to make 300%, that's as insane. So my exit is stop loss only. I exit on stop. My stop is going to be the 15 or the 30 EMA. And I enter, I exit on close and candle. I'll come to close in a moment. I use the 15 EMA for the shorter time frames. So if I'm in a day or less time frame, I'm using the 15 EMA as my stop loss. 
So my 15 gets me in, my 15 gets me out. And then it'll get me back in, it'll get me back out. When I move to longer time frames, i.e. weekly, and I suppose you could trade this in monthly, but even I'm not that patient, I use the 30 EMA. So let's go back to this chart here. So moves below the blue line, which is my 30 week EMA, were my exits because this was a, a, a weekly chart. If you were using the more aggressive system and using the 15 EMA, these re-entries were actually exits and re-entries. So you would have got kicked out and back in and up there with that candle on the, on the right, you would have got kicked out and then a few weeks later you would have got back in. And I'm only exiting. I'm also exiting on a close. So I'm trading a weekly chart. I want it to close on Friday below the, can below the, the, the 30 EMA. I don't care what it does on Tuesday or Wednesday or Thursday or Monday or 2 o'clock on Friday afternoon. The only point I care about is where does it close the candle. And there's a key point because if you're using the 15 as your in and out, the point with this trying to trend based system is it will give you a lot of fake, you know, you'll get in and then spat out. And you'll get in and you get spat out. But when that trend goes, you have to be on the bus. If you're not on the bus, you're not going to make up your losses. You're not going to make a profit. It's critical that you are on the bus when that bus starts running like hard. So I use the 15. So it goes below 15, I'm out. Above 15, I'm back in. But I want to close below 15. Because if it just trades below 15 and I exit and then it goes back up and actually closes above 15, I'm now out of the position, but I want to be in the position. Makes sense. 15 is almost my line. My 30 and 60 tell me direction. But if my direction is up, if we're above the 15 EMA, I'm in the trade. And if we're below it, I'm on the, uh, on the sidelines waiting. But aren't you saying that you're only using the 30 on the weekly? Yes. Because I'm ungeared here. So on the weekly, I'm ungeared. On the, on the daily, I'm geared. Yeah. So that's the, the, the key distinction. So the 30, actually, I mean, again, as I said, this could be an hourly chart. This could be any time frame. The point is, as soon as you drop to, to geared, that 15 starts getting a little far, the 30 starts getting a little far away from you, um, which what that then does is you, you do 2% risk management. So it massively pulls your trade sizes down, and then you make money, but not a heck lot. Make sense? Cool. I'll show you some places and then I'll come back to a live example I pulled yesterday afternoon. So the process. As I said, you determine that trend. You wait for the 15. Next candle green. You enter the trade. Uh, all well and good. Position size. Normal 2% rule. There's a video there which you'll find just one laptop.com slash bootcamp. Look for video number 12. I will touch on it in a moment. Within the IG platform, uh, the local indices, which the only one we have is the uh, SA40. You find it under indices. There is uh, tracking top 40. There's the cash. There's a mini which goes down to two rand a point, although it's a minimum of two contracts. So the micro, the mini, and then the cash at 50 rand a point. So that's in essence the ones that we're going to be uh, uh, trading. The in offshore ones, you go to the offshore platform, there are a gabillion. So I had a really fun last week, week, I was in Cape Town a few weeks ago, whenever it was. And I just went and I just looked at all the different indices out there and et cetera. And I'm looking at different things, right? Because I've got this idea that I want to trade the Italian market so that I can sound suave. Or, or maybe I'll trade the Geneva one so I can sound <laughs> Genevan or whatever. You know, there's reasons behind it. But, but just looking at the, the first trick is most of them are like $20, per, 20 euros per point. That's 300 bucks a point. That's like, whoa. <laughs> um, but most of them like don't move. Like the Kakaron does like a 20 point range for like 17 years. It's like the French went and had a siesta and never woke up. Um, there is anything. The ones I've listed there are obviously the biggies. These are the biggest markets in the world. They're also two degrees. So Wall Street, uh, FTSE, Euros, obviously our time zones. US and Japan, not our time zones. But those are the big indices. But this will work on an index. An index is an index. What you want, though, is an index that moves. You don't mind which direction. You just want an index that moves. You know, <coughs> excuse me. You want an index with a nice tight spread. 
difference between buy and sellers and you want an index where the cost per point doesn't kill you. Now in the IG place, although it's, it's uh, 20 euros or whatever it is per point, they then have a micro contract which is 2 euros per point, which is what, 25, 30 rand, which is not quite as deadly as, as 250 or 300 rand a point. The other thing is that an index, so that, let's take the DAX. The DAX is sitting at 9,500. We're sitting at 4.5 times that. So though we had 10 rand a point in our market here, or whatever the case may be, um, the DAX is doing, you know, a 10 point move on the DAX is, is equivalent of a 50 point move in our market. Because one's at nine and a half and one's at 45. Although it's now at 40 and not much. What's our market at now? 42 and a little. So, I mean, there's everything there. I and mean, you can go trade Brazil, Mexico. I mean, we should all have gone and bought Mexico the day after Trump. Uh, China, and so it goes, et cetera, et cetera. There are more there than you can imagine. Um, always, always, this, is, this rule is the same wherever you go. Watch your spreads, watch your market, watch your costs. You know, don't go and trade. I, so I don't know, but I suspect that, for example, so a low liquid, and I, I'm being completely nasty to the Mexicans, which is not fair because they're having an even, I mean, you think 2016 is tough. Try be Mexican in 2016. Um, I'm imagining that their market is probably fairly small, therefore less liquid, therefore wider spreads. And that might not be true, but what I'm saying is go and check what those average spreads are. Spend a couple of days monitoring a market. What is that spread? How wide is it? Is it onerously wide? Uh, careful if they expire. So you'll note some of the, SA, uh, the contracts are based on futures. They expire. It's the usual thing. Know what you're trading. Know what the expiry date is. Know what IG will do on the expiry date if you have an open position. Spoiler alert, they'll roll you into the next contract. Um, but how much are they going to charge you? Uh, you can request that they don't roll, that they close. That sort of thing. Um, costs are typically in the spread, and then your margins are margins are about 75 points, up to, in some cases, as much as 3.5%. Three and, three and currencies, this works beautifully on currencies. It's just, I mean, so it had you short the pound over st when, 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 when Brexit happened, and... Or, you know, the week Brexit happened, pound collapsed, it rallied, it got you short on the, on the, on the follow-through collapse. I mean, it just it works a treat. Key point, if you're trading FX, and this rule is always applicable, not just for my lazy system. If you're trading FX, trade the four majors, US dollar, British pound, euro, yen. Don't trade anything else. You don't need to. Those four currencies give you everything you need. You know, we go off and we trade the Latvian ruble. And then some oak in Latvia, which I'm sure is a real place, you know, crashes his car and something ha No, 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 no. I mean, the Swiss franc, which fell 40% in it. No, trade the majors. Trade cable, trade US dollar euro, US dollar yen. Trade the majors. There is enough there for you to make to have plenty of trading activity. You've got plenty of pairs, you can trade those. Remember, first currency is base, second is quote. So, if you've got a Euro USD at 110, then 100,000 units is $111,000 because your US dollar is the second currency and therefore the quote currency. So that is called a lot. A lot in the currency market is 100,000 currencies. Ergo, $111,000 of which your margin is going to be about half a percent, so you'd have to put down about 500 or $600. And you will die before the day is over. <laughs> no, because you're sitting on, on, on gearing of, of 200 times. Pull your gearing down. IG will say to you, to open this position, we need $555, please. And you say, cool, here's your $555, but hey, I've got another $45,000 I'm leaving there as my buffer. In other words, look at portfolio leverage. What is the exposure of the portfolio? So let's say you've got $100,000 in your portfolio. I know, if we did, we wouldn't be here. We'd be living at large in the streets of Santa. But let's play, we've got $100,000 in our portfolio. You can then take a position up to three contracts is $330,000 exposure. That gives you a 3.3 times geared on the portfolio. That's nice and gentle. That won't kill you anytime. It might, but 
you'd, it would be a rare event, you'd make the front pages. <laughs> no consolation, you're dead, but you get the point. So don't say, I've got $100,000, I can buy 200 of these and I can get to $2 million. Because then someone in New York sneezes and this thing moves like half a point and you've now got zero dollars. The problem with FX is not FX. The problem with FX is we gear too high. That's quite simple. So you, it's $10 a pip, you get the mini contracts which are 10,000, so pay the mini contracts. The margins will vary, but typically on the majors, they're half a percent. And you will note you're trading down at the extremes of the point. So although I was quoting you euro at 111, it's actually 111.074. You're trading at the 07 point, and then the 06 here. You're trading down at the fourth decimal point when you're trading FX. So just a quick example here, just to understand it. So uh, go along Euro at 111, uh, one contract, which is $10 per pip. A pip is that fourth of a decimal point. So when it goes from 7 to 10, you've made three pips, you've made $30. Your margin will be 530. So if you closed at 112, so it's gone up an entire cent, 100 pips, $1,000. And of course, if it goes against you, pains and sufferings. Big pains and sufferings. The other problem with FX, FX I think is the best thing to trade. I don't trade it. Here's why. Because when you are JP Morgan, Credit Suisse, all the other big banks, I was going to say Deutsche Bank, but they're no longer big. Um, <laughs> Royal Bank of Scotland, they're no longer big. The Italians, we must have some big banks. Eh? Goldman, Sachs. Goldman Sachs, there we go. Thank you, sir. When you work for one of those banks, what do they do? They go find the best six traders in the entire bank. And they take those six traders and they go put them on the FX desk. Because the FX is the biggest, most liquid, most effective, cheapest market in the world to trade. So they take the best traders in the whole wide world and put them on FX. And if you want to make 10 bucks, you've got to get it off that oak or somebody. You've got to, for me to make 10, someone's got to lose 10. So you are trading against the best traders in the world. Now that's a great thing to aspire to. But let's... <laughs> that came out wrong. <laughs> what I'm saying is, let's understand that it's going to take us like a little bit of time before we're one of the best traders in the world. Whereas, opposed to, you're trading the JSC. Man, most oaks in America have no idea that Africa exists. Now, they know Africa exists, right? Like, that's where the coffee comes from, the cocoa. Over there. So, that, you know, you're trading against some oak in Joburg. That seems reasonable. <laughs> I mean, I like Joburg, but I reckon I can beat Joburg any day of the week. I'm from Durban. We're way better than you Joburg oaks. <laughs> so, the, my problem with FX is we overgear it, and then we are trading against the best traders in the world. Unless you go to the Latvian ruble. But, you know, my view on the Latvian ruble. I love Latvia, but I don't want to trade their currency. <laughs> and then, as always, remember perfect trades. How do we measure ourselves? We measure ourselves by, did we do a perfect trade? And when you do a perfect trade, tweet me, hashtag perfect trade. Mail me. Your goal is really simple. One perfect trade. Just one. Another example. SA40. One hour chart. I grabbed it yesterday. This happens to come from last week. So uh, IG won't let me have pretty colors. So I've got purple and pink and stuff like that. Um, so my colors are all wrong. But trust me to say, so you hit the technical, you go to the EMA, you put your 15, your 30, and your 60. There they are, 15, 30, 60. So my 30, which is that bluey line, is below the 60, which is the orangey line, and the pink one is my 15. So there's my big candle down, which gives me a trigger. My next candle's green, so what do I do? Nothing. But it doesn't break the 15, so my trigger's still live, so the, sec the, sec the next candle is red, boom, second arrow, you take yourself a short on the SA40. Uh, this was sometime last week. This is an hourly chart. Off at boogies, down, 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 falling nicely, falling pretty, uh, nice gap down, and then a horrible candle stops you out, you exit at that point. 
This particular trade ran from 1 December to 5 December, so you held over a weekend. It made you 593 points over the process on a one-hour chart. Um, let's go back in time to this red candle here. So that red candle was a short, but didn't confirm, so nothing happened. Dum, 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 dum. Uh, now we have a, another red candle, not confirmed, red candle confirmed. At this point here, you would have gone short and got stopped, and you got taken out for, I'm trying to do the math, you're short there, you lost about 240 points. This might have been, so although IG runs their system 24-7, don't trade this system overnight. Trade it 9 to 5 when markets are live. You can keep it open overnight, but don't enter positions during the night because it's, it's, it's you know, uh, I'm trying to, f oh no, the weekend, ah, there was the weekend, there was the gap for the weekend there. Your overnights are, are just noise, they're horrible. Um, to do the trade, let's say you had a 50k portfolio, 2% rule says you can risk 1,000 Rand, which is 2% of your 50,000 in any one trade. So when you entered the position, at that point there, uh, your stop loss was the 15 EMA. In this case, whoops, 15 EMA was 224 points away. At four, at, at divide 224 into 1,000 means you can go and trade 4 Rand per point, which is two micro contracts. It's slightly lazy because 4 Rand is actually 996. So you were risking slightly under 2% of your portfolio. So you traded four contracts at four mini, uh, sorry, two macros, four rand a point, so it was 2,300 rand was ultimately your profit. Looks nice, but let's not forget that you have losing trades as well. This is not a perfect science. There is no perfect science. Is it advisable? So here's the thing. So, so how else could you do a stop? I mean, there's a bunch of ways we could do a stop. We could do a stop on a touch, in which case down here we would have got stopped there, which is coincidentally exactly where we got stopped, but not often the case. Oftentimes, if we go back to, and I'm going to go back to this chart here because it gives us dum 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 da dum. If we were going to do stops and touches, you got booted out there and then back in. You got booted out there, and and you didn't get back in until here. So the playoff with stop is protecting capital versus staying in the trade, and and they are they are ex spouses and they hate each other. They have cut the dog in half, and now they are eyeing the cockatiel. Um, so so there, there's, there's always going to be that friction in between how do you do it. And, and you know, is my stop the best, most perfect, most brilliant, most Academy Award winning stop in the world? No. <laughs> Let's get real. Um, does it, is it functional? Yeah. yeah and functional is about, I think, about the best we can know. I have spent... I mean, I've been trading now for 22 years, and I have, I have spent more hours than is good for my health on, on trying to find that perfect Academy Award winning stop loss. It's not there. It's not there. For those of you who know Douglas Adams, the answer is 42. <laughs> no, no. It's depressing. For those of you who don't know Douglas Adams, homework. Go read Douglas Adams. Uh, so adapting it, change your time frames, five minutes weeklies, change your times, your EMAs, keep that ratio one, two, four, fiddle with the ratio, bring in some, some, some Bollinger Bands, maybe a MACD, maybe a MACD would be a better stop. Um, and the MACD turns, not at the, 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 the breaking the signal line, but when the histogram turns at the bottom, that might give you a, a better stop there. Tweak it, play with it. If you think MACD is the best thing since, since banana bread, well, look at ways of introducing MACD into the equation. Um, if you think that it might be Bollinger Bands, it, it's critical, and I know I've said this repeatedly, but it, it's, it's important to understand that we need to, that firstly, just because it works for me, doesn't mean that you can't tweak it, doesn't mean that you can't bring what you like into it. You've got to have something which makes sense to you, something which you want to trade. That's what matters most. Trading ultimately is just about getting, generating random things that get you into trades, good risk management, and all will be well. As always, have a plan. This is a plan. If you go to justonelap.com, there are plenty of plans. Have a plan. A bad plan is better than no plan. Most people, excuse me, have no plan. Those guys at JP Morgan, they definitely have a plan. The guys at the Italian banks, I think they lost the plan. Um, <laughs> And start with a demo account. Why do we start with a demo account? We start with a demo account for a couple of reasons. Key most is so we learn the platform. 
Because when you're doing a live trade, the last thing you want to be trying to say is, apart from the fear of a live trade, you now also, what does that mean? Where do I, no, 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 no. Do demos so that when it comes to trade, man, you know this thing like the back of your hand. That is absolutely critical. Don't go against markets. Don't go big. Don't ignore stops. Don't stray from system rules. Change the rules. He has a quick proviso. Don't have two or three bad trades and then change the rules. So I have a rule in my trading life. Is I review all of my trading systems between 16 December and the second Monday in January, which happens to be 9 Jan this year. So I review all of my trading systems over that period, and I'm allowed to change them in that three-week period. During the course of the year, I am not allowed to make a change to a trading system. I make notes. Because otherwise, what happens? Five losers in a row. Some oak on Twitter says, oh, what about banana peels? And you're like, oh, yeah, brilliant. And next thing you know, you've got the system and you don't even recognize it. Now, when you're a newbie, you might want to relax that rule a bit. But put predetermined places. If you're a newbie, say, OK, so once a quarter, I can revisit my trading rules. And why I'm saying when you're a newbie, because there might be more demand to you, because you know, I've, this system's now more than a decade old. But impose, there are timeouts when you can tweak rules. The rest of the time, you follow. Or you walk away, but don't change. Because otherwise, you have a few losing trades, the emotions get to you, someone taunts you on Twitter, some JP Morgan Oak gives you a slap, and before you know it, you have no idea what you're trading anymore. Uh, there is a link down there. So I trade this system ungeared weekly on various ETFs. If you want to receive the Sunday emails as to what we're buying and selling and when we're buying and selling, go to justonelap.com slash trading subs. What's nice about it is I'll send you charts every week. So you can, you know, if you're not, a, you'll get charts. And the more you see of the charts, the more sense it will make to you. Justonelap.com slash trading subs. And you'll find that there. You can sign up for that. We are going into a bit of a siesta because holidays are coming. Um, but we'll kick off again. And if, if, if anything happens over the holidays, I'll bang an email. Otherwise, this weekend, and then we're back again in the new year. Follow-up webcast next week, Wednesday, 14th. You can book at uh, justonelap.com slash events. And what I'm basically doing is taking the system, and I'll spend 30 or 40 minutes on the IG platform. Let's go look at the Latvian ruble. Let's go look at some Bollinger Bands. Let's go look at some Fibonanchos. Let's try some tweaks. Let's look at different indices. Let's play around with it and see what happens. Uh, and if you can't attend, as always, video online the following day. That's me. That's contact details for IG. That's lawyers. <laughs> hey, the font is big, at least. So eh? We have friendly lawyers. Questions? Because I think I have two minutes. No, I have minus two. <laughs> so I will park it. If you've got questions, chat to me after. Send me an email. Send me a tweet. Uh, quick tweet to finish a few things. Housekeeping. Get your parking ticket stamped in reception so you don't pay when you go downstairs. Um, tweak it. Play with it. I've said it. That's absolutely true. Uh, so two last things to finish. This is it. My second last gig for the year. We're at the JC on Thursday with our last last gig for the year. If you want to come, just one lap.com slash events you can book for Thursday. I'm going to tell you what happens next year or maybe what doesn't happen next year, which we will only know. The beauty of predicting the future is you don't know whether I'm right or wrong until we have passed the future. <laughs> but I won't cheat. I will tell you what I said last year so you can see how well I did last year. I said Hillary would win. Hey, that's one of only two things I got wrong. I gave you guys a fake lead there. You're welcome to Thursday. Uh, before that, though, so if you want, come along, JC, 5.30, not 6. Huge thanks for the support this year from everyone coming through to IG, uh, sending us questions, tweeting us, Facebooking us, watching videos, etc. We love what we do, but uh, it wouldn't be any fun if there was just me standing here. Um, it's a lot more fun when there's a whole bunch of people chirping and appreciating and everything. Uh, so really huge thanks from us to the Just One Luck team. Everyone, awesome holidays, awesome 2017. Thank you very much. Thank you.